Edexcel sample assessment materials for AS Mathematics. So one for the year 12s. We've got paper two, which is stats and mechanics. Vamos. So question one says, Sarah is investigating the variation in daily maximum gust T for Camborne in June and July 1987. She used a large data set to select a sample of 20 from June and July data for 1987. Sarah selected the first value using a random number from one to four, and then selected every third value after that. State the sampling technique Sarah used. So they, they might be trying to throw you off slightly with this random, you know, random number thing. You might be thinking, oh, it's some kind of random sampling. But the thing is, after this random number, what's she doing? She's got a system, hasn't she? She's saying every, what is it, third value, I'm going to choose. That's a system. So this is actually systematic sampling because she's going through this data in a systematic way. She's going, okay, this one, now this one, now this one. So this is systematic sampling here. And, and that's all you need for part A. Systematic sampling. Sweet. Part B. From your knowledge of the large data set. Oh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Explain why this process may not generate a sample size of 20. Okay. So you know what? We don't need to know anything super specifically about the kind of master, maximum gust in Cambon for this. It's mainly just in the large data set in general. Loads of the values are missing, you know, because obviously in a perfect world, we've had, well, you know, we'd have all the data, but in reality, there's going to be some data that you just can't collect. And a lot of the time, instead of having a, you know, a value there, it would say NA, right? That there just wouldn't be data available. So in this case, imagine that I'm saying, okay, I need to get every third one. What if I land on one and it's just an NA? I'm not going to be able to do it, am I? So I think the reason that this is not going to work is because, you know, you'll hit one and then you won't be able to, you won't be able to use it. It won't be there. So I'll just say, look, some of the data isn't available. You know, so you may just kind of land on one almost that, that isn't there, <laughs> that doesn't have a value. Um, I just, I don't really think there's anything else you can say about that. I think that, that'll do the job, really. Let's have a look at the last part of the question. It says, the data set collected are summarized as follows. Okay, so n is 20, sample size is 20. The sum of t, so the sum of all of these, uh, you know, daily maximum gusts is 374, and the sum of t squared is 7,600. Calculate the standard deviation. This isn't actually too hard, and I'm going to tell you why. It's in your formula booklet. Right here, look, standard deviation is this. Imagine I have no idea even what it means. It doesn't matter. If I'm just absolutely lost in the exam, I'm like, oh, let's, let's have a look at the formula booklet. And it said, oh, look, standard deviation equals this. And then they give you all of these things there. Then you can just go, oh, just put it into the formula. I hit bag a couple of marks. You know, you don't even need some mad understanding of statistics to do this, which is good because I am crap at statistics. So how are we going to do this? N is 20. The sum of T is 374. Sum of t squared is 7,600. Okay. Well, here I'm seeing, I've got this thing here, haven't I? This is, you know, instead of x, I have t now. So let's write this down. So I've got the square root, and then I've got the sum of x squared, or the sum of t squared in this case, is 7,600. Divided by n, well, n is 20, right? And then minus x bar squared, so in this case, it would be t bar squared. But, Okay. I don't have that yet, do I? But we do know how to work that out because t bar or x bar means the mean, right? And the mean is quite simple when we have this data because the mean is you add them all up and divide by the number there are. So in this case, all of them added up is the sum of t, right? So t bar is just going to be the sum of t over n, over the amount of values. We know that the sum is 374 and we know that n is 20. Cool. So let's put that in my calculator, let's see if it simplifies nicely. 187 over 10, so not really. <laughs> let's let's keep it like that for now. And then I'm just going to sub this into this formula here. So I am going to get the following. Sigma, our standard deviation, is just the square root of all of this stuff. And then minus 187 over 10 squared. That's it. Straight to the calculator. I'm going to do the square root of fraction. 7600 over 20. Minus, then let's have a bracket here, 187 over 10 all squared. 
and it looks like that gets me 5.505 dot 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 let's go three sig fig here we like three sig fig so this is going to be 5.51 and that's question one question two let's have it the partially completed histogram and the partially completed table show the time to the nearest minute that a random sample of motorist was delayed by roadworks and a stretch of motorway cool so we've got a histogram not fully completed and a table down here estimate the percentage of these motorists who were delayed by the roadworks for between 8.5 and 13.5 minutes okay so i mean this would be quite easy they weren't partially completed so maybe i should try to just fully complete them and then it might be a lot easier to see what's popping off so let's get this stuff here get the histogram get the table and let's see if we can kind of fill any of this in so it looks a bit weird, doesn't it? A quick word about this. Look at these groups. This is like four to six. But then you might look at this and be like, well, wait a minute, why isn't that four to six? This is actually what? This is 3.5 to 6.5. But that's because it's been rounded to the nearest minute. So think about it. If I was delayed by 3.5 or 3.6 or 3.7 or anything like that, when I round that to the nearest minute, that would go to four. And then equally on this side, you know, if I was 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, anything just up to 6.5, you would round it down to 6. So that is why these are all of the values that once rounded to the nearest minute give you a value between 4 and 6, right? All of this either gets rounded to 4, 5, or 6. So that's why you actually kind of 0.5 out on either side. Like 7 to 8 actually goes to what? 6.5 to 8.5 uh 16 to 20 is actually 15.5 to 20.5 so that's why you have this kind of extra bit so okay what is popping off <laughs> there is a relationship between the area of each of these bars and the frequency and you know the, the amount of motorists that that bar represents so usually the relationship is proportional meaning that you know, there is some proportional relationship between, like if this is six, that might be, have an area of 12. And then that would mean that all of these bars have an area of twice as much, whatever the frequency is. Sometimes it's equal, like the constant of proportionality is one, which is really nice. So we can check with, for example, this bar, because we know the number of motorists it represents, and we also know kind of how big it is on this diagram. So they don't even give you anything on the y-axis here, and that is because... It doesn't matter because as I say, it's all proportional. So whatever this scale is, it doesn't matter because we only care about how big they are relative to each other. So just count the squares, right? So, you know, this has what? One, two, three squares across and two squares up. So it's six squares, but that's fantastic, isn't it? Because there's six here. So in this case, the constant of proportionality is one. It's basically the area of the bar is how many people are there. So we can now do things because we can work out the area of this bar and we're going to know then that that's the seven to eight box, et cetera, et cetera. So this is two across and then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven up. Two times seven is 14, meaning that there's 14 in this group here. Let's do this here, 16 to 20, which is this bar here. It's going to be one, two, three, four, five across and one up. So five times one is five, right? So I've got five here. So if I now fill in these, you know, for, for this information that we have here, once we have the whole histogram, we can start thinking about actually answering this question. Okay, so the nine box, which would go to what? What number's round to nine? 8.5 to 9.5. So it's just gonna be kind of this here. The 17 in there. So if the width is one, then the height must be 17, right? So if I draw a rectangle, Let's see how I do here. Okay, so this is, it's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, meaning that the width times the height is 45. So three times what, 15 is 45. So I'm gonna have a width of all of this. And then the height is gonna be 15, which is just gonna be two less than this, right? I'm not gonna have to count them all again, which is nice. 
So that's going to look like that. Ugh. Okay, so I've got my histogram, I've got my table. What's the question asking me? Estimate the percentage of these motorists who were delayed by the roadworks for between 8.5 and 13.5. Okay, what am I going to want here? Well, 8.5 is here. So this is kind of my starting point. And then 13.5 is going to be, that's 13, it's going to be here, right? Okay, so I just need the kind of area of all of these blocks, basically. Okay, well, the first one is just this, isn't it? That's the 17, like we just worked that out. So I know I'm going to get my 17 here. This one, well, that's also just that 45, isn't it? So I've got my 45. But then this one, I actually only have a bit of this. So it's not going to be the nine. It's going to be a kind of certain amount of that. Well, it looks like, obviously, this class, class, class width is three. And I'm only one into it. So it's just going to be a third of it, isn't it? Or three, right? So this is the amount of people who I'm estimating are delayed uh, between 8.5 and 13.5. But we need a percentage. So it's just going to be this divided by the total amount of motorists. And then I'm going to need to multiply to 100 to turn it into a percentage. So the total amount is what? Just everyone here, right? Unless they tell me. No, I'll have to do it myself. It's just going to be what? 6 plus 14 plus 17 plus 45 plus 9 plus 5. And then all of that is getting multiplied by 100. So straight to your calculator and I should be good here. So let's do a big fraction and write 17 plus 45 plus 3 divided by 6 plus 14 plus 17 plus 45 plus 9 plus 5. And then all of that is getting multiplied by 100. And I get 67.7%. Sit. Question two. Question three. The Venn diagram shows the probabilities for students at a college taking part in various sports. A is athletics, T is tennis, C is cricket. P and Q are probabilities. The probability, and then we've got this Venn diagram, right? The probability that a student selected at random takes part in athletics or tennis is 0.75. Find the value of P. Okay, sweet. Let's get this diagram up. Athletics or tennis, that's represented by just this whole thing, right? In other words, you know, we, we have the Q plus P plus 0.4. That's athletics or tennis, isn't it? You know, all of those, I'm landing in there. And we're told that that is 0.75. Sweet. Now, part A is a one mark part, and it says find the value of P. So this is an equation with two unknowns, right? So I'm thinking, okay, well, am I going to need to get another equation and solve them simultaneously just to get one mark? Maybe not. Let's write down what the other equation might be, though, just to kind of, you know, give you some instruction here. Like, what information could we use? What else do we know about probability? Well, the other thing we know about probability is that everything must add together to make one. In other words, if I was to have Q plus P plus 0.4 plus 0.05 plus this P, that's one. So I technically have two simultaneous equations here and I can solve them. But why is it only one mark? <laughs> like, is there any way that we could actually just kind of get rid of something, get rid of the Q, for example, without having to do any mad like substitution or elimination? And I think there is, right? Because this here, instead of having to, you know, rearrange for Q or anything, basically we could just take all of this as one and not even involve Q in this, right? We could just say, you know what, why don't I just go, look, I don't care what specifically makes up all of this bit here, but this blob as a whole is 0.75, isn't it? So we could instead just go, well, look, 0.75 and then plus the 0.05 plus the P equals 1, right? And that's a lot easier. I think that's about a one mark worthy equation, right? So all you do is... Take it over to the other side, right? So I'm going to get what? Well, 0 0.75 plus 0 0.05 is 0 0.8, right? I hope. <laughs> so if I just do 1 minus 0 0.8, I'm going to get P. And that's going to be 0 0.2, isn't it? Sweet. Nice one. Let's have a look at part B. 
State giving a reason whether or not the events A and T are statistically independent. Show you working clearly. We need to know the condition for two events to be statistically independent. And that is if the probability of like A and T in this case is the same as the probability of A multiplied by the probability of T, then they're independent. If that's not the case, then they're not independent. So I'm going to write, you might not, depends how your school does it, you might not have learned about kind of this probability notation yet in year 12. Sometimes people wait till year 13. But I want to at least kind of write it down so you know what I'm on about instead of just saying a load of words. It basically says that, look, this thing here in words basically just means the probability of A and T happening. And then basically, if that is the same as the probability of just A happening multiplied by the probability of T happening, then they're independent. Don't worry too much if you've not seen this notation before. You might be waiting until you're 13. That's just, it's just a way for me to write, you know, gather my thoughts here. I can't just write that because I don't know that yet. This is what I'm trying to prove. So I'm going to work out what this is equal to down here, separately work out what this is equal to down here, and then if they're equal, then they're independent, okay? So the probability of A and T happening, look at this Venn diagram, that's the bit in the middle of them, right? That P in the middle is A and T happening. So this straight away is 0 0.2. Sweet. Now what I need to do is I need to work out the probability of A, the probability of T, and then multiply them together. So it looks like I'm now gonna need this value Q. So let's first of all try and get Q. Can I do it from here? I believe I can, because I know the value of P now. So look at this here, Q plus P plus 0.4 is 0.75. Therefore, let's just write that, let's write it here in a little, in a little black box, right? So I'm going to get what Q plus, I now know that P is 0.2, plus 0.4 is 0.75. Okay, that means that Q plus 0.6 is 0.75. So Q is 0.75 minus 0.6. And that is going to be 0.1. Right, sweet. So that's my little aside here. So now, going back to this, I can work out the probability of A, because A is just made up of the circle Q and P. So the probability of A is equal to Q, which is 0 0.15, plus P, which is 0 0.2. And then the probability of T is what? Well, that's the P and the 0 0.4. So P is 0 0.2, and then plus the 0 0.4. So let's work out this. Get your calculator out, give me a bracket, and do 0 0.15, add 0 0.2. Close your bracket, multiply it. Give me another bracket. 0 0.2, add 0 0.4. And I get 0 0.21. Oh, so it's so, so close, but that is not equal to 0 0.2, is it? So these things are not equal to each other. If they're not equal, then they are not independent, okay? They have to be equal for them to be independent, therefore not independent. And this is why it says show you working clearly, right? I mean, you could just coin flip and say, ah, they're not independent, but you ain't getting the marks for that, mate, because there's quite a lot of maths that needs to be done to actually come to that conclusion. Sick. Find the probability that a student selected at random does not take part in athletics or cricket. Let's have a look. Okay, so what are the different things that don't take part in athletics or cricket? Well, obviously everything in cricket is ruled out, you know, and everything in athletics is ruled out. So the only two chunks here that don't take part in athletics and don't take part in cricket are gonna be this chunk and this chunk. So it's just 0.4 add 0.05. Easy as that, right? 0.4 add 0.05. And that's just going to be 0.45. I believe that's question three out of the way. Question four, let's have it. Sarah, again, she's on one today, isn't she? She was studying the relationship between rainfall and humidity in the UK. Took a random sample of 11 days from May 1987 for some place that I'm not going to try and pronounce from the large data set. She obtained the following results. Okay, so she's seeing how two variables relate to each other, right? You know, for, different, for this value of H, what was R, etc. She examined the rainfall figures and found Q1, Q2, and Q3. So these are quartiles, okay? So like, if I've got all my data here, 
basically yeah, Q1, Q2 and Q3 are basically saying, look, what is the value for which 25% of the values are less than it and then 75% are greater? What is the value for which 50% are less and 50% are greater? So Q2 is actually the median here as well. And then for 75%. And then we're giving them. A value that is more than 1.5 times the interquartile range above Q3 is called an outlier. Show that 20.6 is an outlier. Okay, so interquartile range is basically this stuff. It's everything here. It's the middle 50%, isn't it? And how are we going to get that? It's going to be Q3 minus Q1. That's going to give us the length of this red line here. So if I was to just work that out by doing interquartile range is Q3 minus Q1. Q3 is 2.4. Q1 is 0 0.1. So this is 2.3. Cool. So I can actually work out this this outlier barrier, can't I? I can, you know, the value for which, if it's greater than that, you're like, no, it's an outlier. Because I'm going to do, what does it say? I do Q3 plus 1.5 times the interquartile range. So Q3 is 2.4 plus 1.5 times my interquartile range, which is 2.3. Stick that in your calculator. 2.4 plus 1.5 times 2.3 is going to be 5.85. If my value is greater than this, it's an outlier. 20.6! What? <laughs> it's, it's absolutely miles off, isn't it? Look at this. Your, I thought it was going to be like 6 or something. It's just over. It's 20.6. Look at the data here, right? 1.1, 0 0.3, no, no. 3.7, 2.4, 1.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. 20.6. It is absolutely massive. So... This is the thing with outliers, right? They're probably going to lead you to believe it's like, wait, what? Does that actually make sense? Maybe it was a mistake, right? Maybe it was a mistake with the device she used to record the data. It was a human error that she was had a mad night the night before and was just writing whatever she wanted down. Like there were many ways that it could be true, definitely. Maybe there was a mad storm, but it could also just be completely wrong. So basically here, look, 20.6 is way past this barrier here. Therefore, it's an outlier. And Part B is actually talking about this now. It's saying, look, well, why might she include this? So be actually be like, you know what? No, it's, it's crazy, but it's my data. Or why might she exclude it? So she might include it because, look, okay, it's a crazy number, but I'm doing a study, right? Like, surely I gather the data. I can't just pick and choose the data that I like, can I? You know what I mean? Imagine if anyone who did a study just chose only took the results that helped them, you know, or their hypothesis, and then just discarded everything else. Obviously not. Imagine you're trying, you know, you're trying like a new drug, right? And then you're testing it out on people and it works in one person and doesn't in three people. You're not just going to bin off those three people and be like, look, oh, it worked with this guy. Like, so obviously there is, you know, there is a, a kind of a need or a desire to at least represent the data properly. So like, Surely it would be good to actually, you know, include all of the data that you collected, right? So I reckon that would be a good reason to keep it. But then, as I said, there are definitely reasons to, get, to bin it off as well. Because, you know, again, look how much bigger it is than all of the other values. I think it's quite likely here that it just could have been a mistake. And in that case... If it's a mistake, then yeah, you would want to get rid of it because that doesn't actually represent the real, the, the real data, the real situation, does it? It was just some kind of error at some point along the collecting of said data. So yeah, choose yourself, choose yourself. Part C, okay, so it says she decided to exclude it. Fair enough. Good on you, Sarah. And she drew the following scatter diagram. Okay, so obviously the scatter diagram, you know, you've got your diagram. And you're basically saying, you're kind of trying to see if, if it means anything visually. So maybe, you know, you're trying to see how they relate to each other. Maybe you're going to draw your data and it looks like this. And then you're like, oh, okay, this is, this is, this is what we would call a strong positive correlation. Because it's, there's clearly like, as one goes up, the other goes up with it. 
or you might have, for example, a strong negative correlation, right? This goes up, this goes down. Or you could have correlations that aren't as strong. So maybe like it, it's kind of going up like this, but it's not dead on, right? So that's maybe still a positive, but a bit weaker. So it's just a case of looking at what we have and saying, okay, well, what is that? And then relating it to the context. So, okay. I wouldn't say this is the strongest correlation I've ever seen, by no means. But I think there's a bit of a correlation positive, isn't it? Because, I mean, if you look at the values of the humidity of the rainfall that are super low, like near the x-axis, they're really scattered over to the left, aren't they? When the humidity was lower. And then all of the higher values up here, they only really happen when the humidity was higher, you know, you're 95, 96, 97. So, you know, there's, there's still a couple of oddballs, like that one where it's pretty much zero at a pretty high humidity. But again, that's why it's not the strongest correlation. So I would definitely say that we have a positive correlation here. So, but don't just say that because you want to, you want to relate this to the situation at hand. So, you know, what are the variables on these axes? What is the fact that when X goes up, Y goes up, what does that mean? Well, in our case, it means that as the humidity goes up, the rainfall goes up, right? So I would say as humidity increases, rainfall increases. And I believe that should be okay. Uh, where are we now? Oh, here we go, part D. The equation of the regression line of R and H for these days is that. Give an interpretation of the gradient of this regression line. Okay, so going back to that scatter diagram that I drew, a regression line, it's almost like a line of best fit, right? You know, if you've got your data, wherever it may be, this is you trying to say, okay, well, let's give a bit of a, I reckon that the data would, you know, go like that. It's trying, you know, you making a mathematical relationship out of the data that you have. So you draw your line of best fit, right? And then you go, okay, well, I've got an equation of this. It's minus 12.8 plus 0.15h. Give an interpretation of the gradient of this line. So that is remembering that R and H mean something. I mean, rainfall and humidity, respectively. So gradients, right, are the steepness. So it's basically saying gradient says, look, if my X, or in this case, H, goes up by one, then in this case, it's saying that the rainfall goes up by 0.15, right? So that's what it's saying. We just say, look, this 0.15 gradient means that if H goes up by 1%, then R goes up by 0.15, right? So I could say that, <laughs> essentially, right? You know, as H goes up, up by 1%, R increases by 0.15, I believe it's in millimeters, right? Millimeters, yeah. So then, you know, Maybe you, you would give it in a in some nicer numbers because 0.15 millimeters is very small. You could maybe say this is the same thing, man. You don't need to say this, but to give a you know bit of bit more detail. If H goes up 10%, then R would go up by 1.5, right? Just to give a bit more detail there. So yeah, that's what you do. It's basically saying one of them goes up, what does the other one do and how much? Cool, last part says, comment on the suitability of Sarah's sampling method for this study. Okay, so now we actually have to look at the way she did this and be like, well, you could have done that better. So let's have a look. Let's go back to the start of the question. So she's trying to study the relationship between rainfall and humidity in the UK, in the United Kingdom. But the only way she does that is she takes just 11 days from one place, from one place. So, I mean, this is, this is bringing a lot of, this is bringing Sarah's credibility into question, isn't it? Because it's like, do, does Sarah think that the rainfall in Lucas <laughs> is the same as in Manchester or in Birmingham or in Leeds or in Edinburgh or in Cornwall or in Devon? You know what I mean? Like, probably not. So, you know, she only uses one location. I don't like that. And also, she only uses 11 days, which isn't, uh, it's not a massive sample size, is it, right? 11 days from one location. Is, do you think that's really gonna represent the rainfall in the all, all of the UK? The other thing that you could say, 
She takes all of these days from May. So you're kind of getting into summertime, you know, probably the weather's going to be different in May than in January, isn't there? So like she's really, she's not done her homework here, has she? So suggest how she could make it better again. So, well, I mean, in the large data set specifically, there's more places. Use more locations from around the UK. Use more locations from around the UK, which there are in the large data set. Uh, sweet, that's question four. I believe we should only have one more for stats. So let's have it. The discrete random variable X is distributed binomially with 40 trials and a probability of 0.27. Find the probability that X is greater than or equal to 16. So my calculator can give me this, but my calculator only gives me less than or equal to probabilities. So if I think of the different numbers this can be, you know, everything on the left, 14, 15, 16, da, 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 da. I want everything up here. What I can do is do one minus everything down here, right? So this is gonna be one minus the probability that it's less than or equal to 15. And my calculator will give me this. So if I go to menu, seven for distributions, go down to binomial CD, cumulative distribution, variable. Now X is gonna be 15, because that's the probability I want, and then N and P are the parameters. So 40 and 0.27. This gets me 0.949077 dot dot dot. And go to menu, back to one for the normal, and just do one minus answer. And then this is gonna be what? 0 0.05092 dot dot dot. Let's go three sig fig, 0 0.0509. Cool, part B. Past records suggest that 30% of customers who buy baked beans here, now we're on to the important stuff. Finally, here we go. From a large supermarket, buy them in single tins. The questions of life, right? A new manager suspects that there has been a change in the proportion of customers who buy baked beans in single tins. We're answering life's questions. A random sample of 20 customers who had bought baked beans was taken. Write down the hypotheses that should be used to test the manager's suspicion. Okay, so we've got this kind of binomial distribution, right? You, you take these 20 people and you say, okay, well, you either <laughs> bought baked beans in a single tin or not, you know, in one of the multi-packs. So the past proportion of people who bought in single tins was 30%. So in this case, it would be the probability of single tin is 0.3, but this is what we're trying to test. So this is actually unknown now, isn't it? So this would be P, for example. And then our hypotheses are gonna be based around this value of P, this proportion. So my H naught is what was just generally accepted to be true in the past, which is that P is 0 0.3. And my H1 is that P is just not 0 0.3. Because it just says the manager suspects that there is a change in proportion. It doesn't say the manager thinks that uh, the proportion has increased or the proportion has decreased. In those cases, it would maybe be P is greater than or less than 0.3, but it's just saying there's a change. So it's saying it might be less, it might be greater than, we don't know. It's just not equal to 0.3. So they're the hypotheses. It now says using a 10% level of significance, find the critical region for a two-tailed hypothesis test to answer the manager's suspicion, you should set the probability of rejection in each tail, which should be less than 0 0.05. Okay. Generally, when we're getting a critical region, like when I go and do this sample, what are gonna be the values that lead me to suggest that P has changed? Well, it's gonna be if I get a really small value or a massive value. Like for example, if I get, you know, if none of them had bought in, in single tins, you'd be like, okay, well, I really doubt that 30% buy in single tins if none of these. Equally, if 20 of them bought in single tins, right, then you'd be like, okay, I really doubt it's 0.3, it's probably much higher, right? So, you, you know, you've got all your values here and you're essentially looking for either really low values or really high values. And you want the probability, so we, we've got 10% level of significance here. So we wanna share that between two tails. So we want this to be 5% and we want this to be 5%. In other words, I want some value 
such that the probability that, you know, this y distribution is less than or equal to this value, right? So whatever this value happens to be, critical value, I want that to not pass 5%. So I want it to be really unlikely. So I want it to be less than 0.05, right? So I can just do trial and error. Go to menu, get back to your binomial CD, binomial CD variable, put your variables in. So n is going to be 20. And now this is all assuming that h0 is true. So assuming that p is 0.3. And then you trial and error it. So put in x equals 0, right? Tiny number. Put in x equals 1. Still tiny number. And we're waiting for it to go past 5%. Put in x equals 2. x equals 2, for example, gives me 0.03548 dot dot dot. Okay. So that's still not hit 5%, has it? So let's go to x equals 3. Put in x equals 3. So the, or y is 3, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this thing here is equal to about 10%. So that's, you know, that's way over my 5%, isn't it? So that's, the 3 is past my critical region. So I can't use that. So it's going to have to be 2, isn't it? Because 2 lies within, but then 3 lies outside. So on the left-hand side, 2 is the one I want. Now I need to work out the one on the right-hand side. Now, I'm going to explain this to you. I'm going to do it quite quickly because, you know, I'm in an exam. I don't want to fully explain everything. If you want a full explanation of it, go to AI Tutor, and I do talk about it in more detail with a lot of examples. But basically, get ready. So essentially, I want the same thing. I want a value such that the value, you know, now I'm on the, this tail, so it's going to be greater than that value, and I want it to be less than 0.05. The problem is my calculator doesn't give me this, but my calculator does give me less than values. So I'm actually going to do exactly the same thing that I did in part A. What have I done? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, here we go. So part A, look, I said that if I want the probability that it's greater than or equal to 16, I need to do 1 minus the probability that it's less than or equal to 15, right? 16 minus 1. I've not done anything different here, it's just algebra. Probability that it's greater than or equal to CV is 1 minus the probability that it's less than or equal to CV minus 1. So let's rearrange. I'm going to take this over to here and that over to there. So I'm going to get 1 minus 0.05 is less than the probability that Y is less than or equal to CV minus 1. This is 0.95. Therefore, I am looking for values such that it's the probability that it's less than or equal to that value is just past 0.95. So I've still got the stuff in my calculator, but obviously I'm going to be looking for bigger values now. Let's go 7, for example. That's 0.77, not bigger than 0.95. Let's go 8. 0.88, not bigger than 0.95. What about 9? Ah, here we go. So the probability that y is less than or equal to 9 is equal to 0.952, so just bigger than 0.95. Fantastic, you know, 2038 dot dot dot. Therefore, this CV minus 1 is equal to 9, isn't it? So CV minus 1 is equal to 9, but that's not my CV because I need to add the 1 to it. So the CV is going to be 10. Again, all of this is confusing. I'm not going to, you know, spend ages talking about it now. But as I said, go to AI Tutor and you can understand it more. So that means that my full critical region is basically any values of y that I get less than or equal to 2 or greater than or equal to 10. They are the two extremities, the two tails. Fantastic. And it then says find the actual significance level. Okay, so we use the significance level to get these values, don't we? We say, okay, give me a value such that the probability in this tail is 5% and the probability in this tail is 5%. But this is a discrete distribution, so it goes in jumps. Because look what happened here. I got 2, and the probability was about 3.5%, wasn't it? Which I got here. And then I went to 3, and it was like 10%. 
So at no point did I actually get this perfect 5% probability. And that's because there's nothing between two and three in a discrete distribution. It goes in jumps. So there's nothing I can do about that. So that's why the significance level for this tail isn't actually 5%, is it? It's about 3.5%. That's what we mean by actual significance level. So this doesn't happen in continuous distributions because you can get, you know, right on that because it can be any value, but it can't in discrete. So what I do is I just add my 3.5% from here and then also the probability from here. So this one is 0 0.354, 0 0.0358, right? 0.0348. And then this one here, well, I need to do the one minus this to get this, don't I? So this is going to be, I'm just going to do, oh, I've still got that as my ants, which is perfect. So go back to your normal mode and just do one minus ants. This is going to be kind of 0 0.0479618 dot 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 dot. So now I need to do that, add that, and that should get me the final answer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, well, that answer plus 0 0.03548, which gets me 0 0.0834 dot dot dot, which as a percentage is what? Not point, oh, I'm losing the absolute plot here. It's going to be 8.34%. Sweet. Okay. So part E then says, one afternoon, the manager observes that 12 of the 20 customers who bought baked beans bought their beans in single tins. Okay. Comment on the manager's suspicion in the light of this observation. Uh, okay, well, 12 is in the critical region, isn't it? Because it's saying that if you get a value greater than or equal to 10, you're in the critical region. So in this case, 12 in the critical region, you know, therefore, it would give the manager reason to reject H0, basically, and believe that uh, the proportion of people buying baked beans in singletons has changed, hasn't it? Because that's what the whole hypothesis test was about. It's saying, if you get a value less than or equal to two or greater than or equal to 10, then that gives you reason to believe that the proportion has changed. Cool, F. Later it was discovered that the local scout group visited, this, what a question, man. Baked beans and scouts, the supermarket that afternoon to buy food for their camping trip. Comments on the validity of the model used to obtain the answer to part E, giving a reason for your answer. Okay, sweet. So look at look at part E. It's on about, you know, 12 of the 20 customers who bought baked beans bought them in single tins, right? Here's the thing though. This is all a binomial distribution, isn't it? But there's a key thing with binomials, and it's that you need the trials to be independent. You need this probability to not change. However, so, you know, when you have kind of single customers coming in, you, it might be reasonable to expect that, you know, random guy in the supermarket buys some baked beans, and then two hours later, some other random guy buys some other baked beans. Their decision isn't going to affect each other, is it? However... If a local scout group comes in, right, then, you know, and there's 20 of them or however many of them, and they just go straight to the baked beans because they love them and just buy like 20 multi-packs or 20 single cans of baked beans, then they're not independent, are they, right? So we can see here that, you know, it's not always independent trials. You have to always be questioning these perfect world assumptions. So I think in this case, I would say, well, look, for part E, this whole thing that I said about rejecting, that requires the trials to be independent, or else it wouldn't be binomial. Uh, or else it wouldn't be binomial. Uh, with the scouts, the trials wouldn't be independent because they'd all be together, right? They'd all be buying the same thing or telling each other what to buy, etc. Uh, so you basically wouldn't be able to reject this or, you know, the whole thing wouldn't be valid. So the distribution wouldn't be valid. 
would not be valid. And it may just like, it'll just be, it'd invalidate the whole thing, wouldn't it? It would invalidate the, the hypothesis test, really. Because the whole distribution that you were assuming then just wouldn't be the case anymore. So I reckon that is more than enough for question five. We're on to the mechanics. I feel like it's the home straight at this point, isn't it? Let's have a read of it. It says a car moves along a straight horizontal road. Time t is naught, the velocity of the car is u, and accelerates with constant acceleration a for t seconds. The car travels a distance d during these t seconds. Figure one shows all of that. <laughs> Using the graph, show that d equals ut plus a half at squared. And then it says, no credit will be given for answers which use the kinematic Suvat formula. This is the thing. This is one of the Suvat formulas, isn't it? d or s equals ut plus half at squared. So they're just asking you to derive that. So obviously you can't just use it. You need to show that that's the case. Let's get the graph up here. And there's one piece of information that we're really going to want to be using. And that is that the distance traveled or displacement is the area under the velocity time graph. In other words, d, this distance, is this whole area. So it's whatever way you want to get it, right? Two options. You could say, well, this is a trapezium, minute. We could do that. That's what I'd do. Or if you just happen to forget the area of a trapezium, you could split this up into a rectangle and a triangle. Either way. So I'm going to do the trapezium. So what do we need for the area of a trapezium? So the area of a trapezium is a half times a plus b times h. Now, what are these values? So the a and the b are going to be the heights, these parallel heights here. So that would be a and b. And then h would be this thing here. So this would kind of be h going all this way. So we just need all of these. You get all of these, you sweep. Well, the first thing is that we know A because it's just U. We know H because that's just T. So we just need to get B here, don't we? How are we going to do that? So we can see that just this bit up to here is U. Can we get this bit here? What other thing do we have? What other piece of information do we have? We know the acceleration. And you should also know that the acceleration is the gradient of a velocity time graph. In other words, we know that the gradient here is A. So the question is then, what is this height going to be if we know that the gradient is A? Well, we know that for each one, for each one it goes up on the t-axis, it goes up by A. So if it goes up by big T on the t-axis, it's just going to Go, if it goes along by big T, it's going to go up by A, lots of big T, right? So all of that is just going to be AT. Okay. In other words, all of this is going to be what? Well, this thing here is U. So this is going to be U plus AT. So I think I've got enough now. So the D, the distance, is going to be what? A half times A, which is the U plus b, which is the u plus a t, right? Times by h, which is t. Sweet. What do we get? We're going to get a half. That's going to be 2u plus a t, all multiplied by t. Okay. Let's multiply this half in here first. So a half times 2u is going to be u. Half times a t is just a half a t. Can we see it yet? I'm now going to times everything by the t to get d equals ut plus a half a t squared. Let's see what seven's got in store. A car is moving along a straight horizontal road with constant acceleration. Constant acceleration means you can use SUVAT. There are three points a, b, and c in that order on the road. a, b, 22, b, c, 104, two seconds travel from a to b, four seconds travel from b to c, find the acceleration of the car. Okay, loads of information. Before doing any maths, we're going to need to work out what is kicking off, right? So here's the thing. We've got a straight horizontal road. So it's probably quite easy to draw a diagram here, isn't it? Like, I've got three points, A, B, and C. And then what do we know? We know that this is 22 meters. It's much easier to digest a really simple diagram with a couple of lines on it than just a chunk of text, you know what I mean? 
Sweet. Okay, what else? And then we've got two seconds and four seconds. Two seconds. Oh, I can't be bothered writing the units. And then four seconds. That's a lot simpler, <laughs> okay? So here's the thing. It's definitely a Subat question. But the question is, like, how do I even start? Like, we need to define, every time you're doing Subat, so you're definitely going to have to, you know, write out your Subat variables. But before we even do that, you need to actually decide, well, what section or chunk of motion am I even doing the SUVAT on, right? Because here's the thing, there's actually three options here. The first option is I can do a SUVAT on all of the motion, right, A to C. The second option is I can do a SUVAT on A to B. And then the third option is I can do a SUVAT on B to C. So there's actually three different ways that I can get SUVAT equations here. And I want you to always have this thought process before you jump into any maths, because then you're just gonna get, if you don't really have it defined in your head, which bit of motion you're doing this on, you're gonna be like, well, what's T, which distance am I using? It's just not gonna go well. So here's what I think. I'm seeing that the whole thing's seven marks. So I feel like we're probably gonna have to do more than one SUVAT equation here. Right, here's the thing. I want to do this one and this one, and I'll tell you why. So the black line, we, we could get all of the information for that, you know, we can have the total time, total distance and everything. And then, you know, same for the red. Now, there's something important here. When you do two SUVATs, more often than not, you've got simultaneous equations, okay? So I'm going to do a SUVAT for, for example, the red, and then a SUVAT for the black, right? Now, when you do two SUVATs and you have simultaneous equations, you're gonna need variables relating to each other, okay? So, you you know, to, to then use them and say, oh, this is the same A, for example. So here's the thing. Let's fill it in for the, let's fill it in for the red. And let, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean, you'll, ex, you'll see this, okay? So for the red, the distance, well, it's 22, we know that. U is just the velocity at the start here. We don't know that, do we? But why don't we just call it U, right? And this is the one I wanted to talk about. Going to this black one, what is the initial velocity gonna be? It's gonna be the velocity at A, isn't it? Because they both start at the same place. So this is why I'm choosing the red and the black, because they have the same initial velocity, so I can therefore have the same variable in both my equations. Imagine if I did it with this, I wouldn't be able to say that with the u, would I? Because the u now is the velocity at b, but we don't know that. So that is why I chose a to b and a to c, because they're going to share the same u, they're also going to share the same a, aren't they? Because, you know, throughout this whole thing, it's got constant acceleration. So we know that whatever happens now, we're going to have two simultaneous equations in u and a. And I know that they're the same because of all of that that I've just gone on about. So let's carry on filling this in. Do we know the time for the red? We do, that's two seconds. And we don't know V, do we? The distance for the black is gonna be this whole thing, isn't it? So 22 out of 104, what's that? 126, right? So that's gonna be uh, 126 meters here. Do we know V? No, but we do know the time because it's two at four, which is six. Cool, so you can see what's going on. Two simultaneous equations, right? So it's going to be s equals ut plus a half at squared. It's actually the equation we derived in the last question. Okay, well, you just stick it in at this point. Now it's algebra. Now it's algebra, okay? So this s is going to be 22, which is going to be ut, so 2u, plus a half a times 2 squared. Let's clean this up. That's going to be 2u. 2 squared is 4, half that is 2, so plus 2a, and I can divide by 2. So let's just get it as clean as possible. 11 equals u plus a. Sick. Let's call that equation 1. Let's go for this one. 126 equals ut, so 6u, plus a half a t squared. 6u. 6 squared is 36, half that is 18. Cool, uh, I can probably cancel this in some kind of nice way. Why don't we see, let's see if six goes into 126. It does, so it's, that's 21. So if I divide everything by six, I get 21 
equals u plus 3a. Okay, now this is pretty sweet at this point. Why don't, I'm seeing that the u's match up here. So if I was to do equation two minus equation one, I would get the following. Two minus one would give me. Left-hand side, I'd get 21 minus 11. Right-hand side, I'd get u plus 3a minus u plus a. 21 minus 11 is 10. U minus U gets cancelled. 3A minus A is 2A. Therefore, A equals 5 meters per second squared. What about U? Will you just put it in wherever you want here? Why don't we put it into 1? So that would tell me that 11 equals U plus 5, which implies that U equals 6, and that is meters per second. Question 8. A bird leaves its nest at times equal zero for a short flight along a straight line, then returns to its nest. The bird is modelled as a particle moving in a straight horizontal line. The distance, s metres of the bird from its nest at time t seconds, is given by a pretty grim looking thing. Explain the restriction, t is between 0 and 10. Well, let's have a look at s here, because essentially what's going on, right, is you've got your nest. The bird then goes off and then comes back to its nest, right? That's what it's saying. And then obviously, whatever, you know, my position along here, or the distance from here to here is gonna be S. So, here we go, look at S, right? I think we can clean this up a bit. It's got a common factor of T squared in it, hasn't it? So if I take T squared out of that, I'm gonna get T squared minus 20T plus 100, Ah, okay, right. I can factorise that other bracket, can't I? So that's going to be 1 over 10 t squared. This is actually t minus 10 squared. So if I multiply that out, I'd get t squared minus 2 lots of t times minus 10 plus minus 10 squared. Sweet. <coughs> well, I just can't stop sneezing. Okay, so th I think this explains this pretty nicely. Because clearly when t is 0... S is zero, right? Sub in t equals zero, this whole thing is zero. But also when t is 10, S is zero because of this bracket here. So it'd be 10 minus 10, which is zero squared, obviously. So when t is zero and t equals 10, S is zero. So that means that I start off t is zero, that makes sense. My, you know, at the start, my distance from the nest is zero, obviously. I then go up here, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling turn around at some point, wherever that point may be, and then I go back, and then at 10 seconds, boom, my distance is zero again. So the other thing is that between 0 and 10, this thing is always positive, isn't it? Because I've got a squared number and a squared number. So this thing can't be negative, and it's greater than zero. So, you know, at the start and the end, S is zero, which makes sense. That's going and coming back to the nest, and when t is between these two values, so not equal to them, but between them, s is greater than zero. So that completely makes sense. That describes this motion here, which I now realize is just a load of lines, so really doesn't make any sense. But that's part A. Part B. Find the distance of the bird from the nest when the bird first comes to instantaneous rest. Okay, six marks, because there's about three things we need to do here. Instantaneous rest. I am at rest if my velocity is zero. Not my displacement, right? Because my displacement could be non-zero, it could be six, but I could be chilling and not moving. The thing that tells me if I'm moving or at rest or something is my velocity, my speed, right? So if I somehow find the velocity here and then set it equal to zero, that's gonna tell me the time when my velocity is zero, right? How do I get velocity? From displacement, I have to differentiate. So v is ds by dt, essentially. We can't use suvat because it's not constant acceleration. When we can't do that, we use calculus. So we differentiate this. It's definitely going to be easier to differentiate what they gave me rather than that factorized thing. So I'm going to keep this tenth out here, and then I'm going to differentiate each term inside the bracket. So that's going to be 40 cubed minus 60t squared plus 200t. 
And now I want to set this equal to zero and let's see what I can do. So the first thing is I can get rid of, you know, I can divide both sides by a tenth and then, you know, nothing happens on the right hand side. I can also take a t out. So I'm going to get t. That's gone. Taking a t out, I'm going to get what? 40 squared minus 60 t plus 200 equals zero. I can also divide by four. So I'm going to do, that's going to be t squared. That's going to be 15 t and that's going to be 50. Now I think I'm getting in a much better spot equals zero. Can I find two numbers that add together to make minus 15 and multiply to get 50? I think I can, because if I had minus 10 and minus five, it's gonna work out. Minus 10 minus five is 15, minus 10 times minus five is positive 50. So I have three times, don't I, that uh, the bird is at instantaneous rest, right? So the first one is t equals zero, I suppose. The, but that's kind of just at the start, isn't it? So we're not really bothered about that. The second one is t equals five, and the third one is t equals 10. Okay, so zero is, the, is just the star. And then the one that they want is, look, it says when it first comes to instantaneous rest. So it first comes to rest, it's equals five, which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? Because that is actually, that would be the turning point, and then it goes back. So t is five. But I'm not done yet because I now need to work out the distance. But that's not going to be too hard because I have the t equals 5. I just need to sub it in to the s formula because that is the distance. So when t equals 5, s is going to equal... Stick it in. Nothing too crazy. So I'm going to get 5 to the 4 minus 20 times 5 cubed plus 100 times 5 squared to the calculator. Okay, here we go. One over 10, big bracket, five to the power of four, minus 20 times five cubed, plus 100 times five squared, which is going to give me 125 over two, or 62.5 meters. And I think that's it for eight. Question nine, let's go. A small ball A of mass 2.5 kilos is held at rest on a rough horizontal table. The ball is attached to one end of a string. String passes over a pulley P, which is fixed at the edge of the table. All of this is just gonna be describing what you can see, by the way. So I'll just, yeah. The other end of the string is such a small ball B of mass 1.5 kg, hanging freely, vertically below P, and with B a height of a meter above the horizontal floor. Exactly what we can see. System is release. Think they mean released, but whatever, from rest with a string taut as shown in figure two. The resistance to the motion of A from the rough table is modeled as having constant magnitude 12.7. Ball B reaches the floor before ball A reaches the pulley. Okay, modeled as particles, strings modeled as being light and extensible, pulley is modeled as being small and smooth, and the acceleration due to gravity G is modeled. A lot of modeling, that's 9.8. My breath, man. Right, write down an equation of motion for A. Okay, let's get the diagram up. Don't even, don't even look at what they're asking you before you put the forces on this diagram. Just don't, honestly. I'm, I'm not even reading it. So what do we have? What's going on here? Okay, well, let's have a look at A. It's got a weight, hasn't it? You know, it's got a weight going down. Weight is always mass times gravity, so this is going to be 2.5 g. The reason it's not falling through the table is because the table is producing a reaction force that's going vertically upwards on it. I don't think we're gonna need this, but it's there. It's also being pulled, isn't it? Because B is falling down. So obviously B is going down here, which is gonna pull this this way. So the tension in the string T is causing A to move to the right. And we're also told that it's got resistance to motion. So the resistance to motion, if it's gonna go this way, it's going to be going the opposite way, and that is 12.7. A lot of forces, but it's a lot easier once they're on the diagram. Let's have a look at B. It also has weight, right? 1.5 g going downwards. What else? Well, the string is doing something clearly, isn't it? Now, for some reason, a lot of, a lot of people that I teach think that the tension's going down here because B is going down. But that's not the case, is it? Because if this string wasn't here, what would happen? 
Well, B would carry, you know, it would fall down, but even quicker. So yes, B is still falling down, but the thing that the string is trying to do is actually pull B up a bit because it's slowing B down, isn't it? You know, if it wasn't for that, B would be in free fall, absolutely razzing it. But it's at least slowing it down a tiny bit. So tension is going upwards here. And there's nothing else. Okay, cool. So an equation of motion for A. So an equation of motion is usually either going to be like, it's something to do with the force. So it's either going to be, or it's an equilibrium. So, you know, like up equals down, left equals right. Or it's accelerating, in which case you would get F equals MA. So is accelerating in this case? I believe so, because it's released from rest. So what happens is F equals MA, this F is the resultant force. So this is super important. This F is not a single force you see on your diagram. It's a combination of them. It's the resultant force in the direction of motion. So if A is accelerating this way, then the resultant force is going to be everything taking it that way minus everything taking it the other way, right? Everything taking it that way minus everything opposing that motion. And that is going to equal its mass, which is 2.5 times A, which I believe we don't know. Cool. So what is taking it this way? The tension. What's taking it that way? 12.7. So I believe that the equation of motion for A would be T minus 12.7 equals 2.5 A. Do the same thing for B. So which direction is B accelerating in? Downwards. So it's going to be down minus up equals ma. What's taking it downwards? The 1.5g minus everything taken up, which is the tension, equals 1.5a. So why is this useful? Because again, two equations with the same two unknowns. The whole point, the whole point of connected particles is that because these particles are connected, they share the same acceleration and tension. And you are going to see this all the time. And your equations are pretty much going to look like this every time. We're now going to be asked to sol solve them. Yeah, hence find the acceleration of B. Look, it's easy. And the reason is, look at these equations. What would happen if I add them together? The tensions would just perfectly cancel out, wouldn't they? So let's do that. So I'd get T minus 12.7, add 1.5G minus T, equals 2.5A, plus 1.5a. You're going to see this so many times. T's are gone. 1.5g minus 12.7 left. 2.5a plus 1.5a is 4a. So dividing by 4 gives me the following, which I'll work out for you. I'll work out for you. So I'm going to get 1.5, and then we're told to take g as 9.8 minus 12.7 over 4, and I get a lovely 0.5 ms to the minus 2. Cool. C, I believe. Here we go. Using the model, find the time it takes from release for B to reach the floor. Okay, so this is that moment. Right, this is a forces question, isn't it? This is the moment where they, they, uh, they teleport into the SUVAT world. And the reason I know that is because think about forces and all of the different kind of quantities that appear in the equations. Like F equals MA, obviously force, and then mass, acceleration. At no point in the forces equations do we have any of the other SUVAT variables. So by that, I mean what? Velocity. Where's velocity in F equals MA? It's not there. Time. Is time and F equals MA? No. The only link between the forces world and the kinematic SUVAT world is acceleration. So we've done our forces, got our acceleration, we can then use that in the SUVATs. Because look, if I was to write out my SUVAT variables now, I already know my acceleration, right? It's 0.5. And then everything else here is just SUVAT world. Forces doesn't care about it. But we know some of it, right? Because B, falling to the floor. We, looking at the diagram, it's one meter away from the floor, so S is going to be one. U is zero because, you know, at the start, it says the system is released from rest. And then V, we don't know. Please, please stop saying that V is zero when you hit the floor. It's just not, is it? Like, if V was zero, 
When I hit the floor, I could jump out my window right now and it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> but it's not, it's, you, you hit the floor, okay? Yes, like, after that, you know, then it might come to a rest. But the velocity with which it, you know, hits the floor, it's just not zero. So please kill that while it's young, okay? Time, that's what we're trying to find out. So what equation do we know that relates S, U, A, and T? It's the one that we've used about 10 times already in this video. S equals UT plus a half AT squared. Okay, so S is one. UT, well, that's just zero because U zero. A half A T squared. Okay, well, what is a half times 0 0.5? That's a quarter, right? Times by four. Square root both sides, and we do not need the negative square root in this case because time cannot be negative. So T is two seconds. That's it. Part D, suggest two improvements that could be made to the model. Okay, let's have a think. Uh, well, the first thing that usually, that I usually go for is when we're modeling things as particles, right? Like, you know, like everything just acting at one point, you lose quite a lot. Because in reality, you know, if something's a particle, it's, if something's not a particle, sorry, maybe the, you know, the resistances on the shape are going to be different at different parts. It might have a different kind of friction. The, the air resistance is going to differ. It might, you know, some parts of it might be in one place, but then another, like, there's a lot more, you know, it might spin about. There's a lot more that you need to consider when balls or any shape is not a particle. So the first thing that I would always do is consider the actual dimensions you know, of, in this case, what? The balls. I know, I know. Shut up. <laughs> right? And then, let's think. So, to another improvement. Um, so, we're told that the resistance to motion is a constant 12.7, but I don't think that would really be true. Because think about ways you can get resistance. Like, you can, you can have friction. You can also have air resistance. And basically, the faster you're going through the air, the more resistance you're going to have. It's, I think it's proportional to like the square of the velocity or something. So if you think about it, at the start, A wouldn't have that much air resistance, but then it accelerates, doesn't it? It's going to speed up, speed up, speed up. As it speeds up, the air resistance is going to be going higher, isn't it? So in reality, you wouldn't have this constant 12.7. It would be something small, and then it would get higher and higher. So I would say you know, use a variable resistance to motion. As opposed to the constant 12.7. So I think a variable resistance to motion and the dimensions here of A and B would be, you know, good ways to improve the model. And I think that's it, actually. So, yeah, not bad. Um, you know, definitely not as bad as the year 13 stats and mechanics papers, which you're free to have a look at if you want. But definitely a really, really good way to get practice in, especially for those of you in year 12 and, you know, early on in year 13, if you want to kind of catch up on all of your stats and mechanics from year 12 before cracking on with the year 13 stuff. Sweet!